Good afternoon, or good morning, or good night, depending on where you are. My name is Ricky Burdett. I'm a professor of urban studies at the London School of Economics and director of LSE Cities. I'm very quickly going to introduce the evening and then pass on to the chair, Adrian Ellis. Uh, welcome to the Urban Age Debates. This is the fourth in a series of discussions about the future of cities in the 2020s, organized together by the Alfred Herrhausen Gesellschaft and LSE Cities, a research center here at the LSE. Um, as I say, it's a series which has started in January, looking at issues of changing patterns of work in the city. Then we looked at public space, then at public transport, and now today, this evening, on the issue of culture. We will then conclude the series later in the year with a discussion, a similar one, on changing patterns of retail. Now, to um, have a very good debate about the issue of culture, we've decided to work with uh, a person who knows about what he's talking, and that is Adrian Ellis. Adrian Ellis is an old friend and an expert in this field of culture. He's been working in the field for over 30 years, running a consultancy called the AEA Consulting, and very relevant to tonight's event. He's also the chair and the founder of the cultural, the Global Cultural Districts Network, um, which brings together an enormous number of um, cultural districts from different parts of the world. And I want to thank them for partnering as knowledge partner in this event. So thank you for joining in to this event. And I now pass on to Adrian Ellis. Adrian, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ricky. And uh, thank you both for in inviting me to moderate this event and, and to give the GCDN an, an opportunity to, to uh, contribute to this, this series. Um, you mentioned that I had been in this uh, uh, sector for 30 years. That 30 years, um, throughout pretty well that 30 years, there has been a long sweep of investment in um, culture and particularly in cultural inf infrastructure, arts buildings, if you like. Um, and a lot of that long sweep has been informed by um, or, or um, prompted by urban policy rather than cultural policy per se. If you think about um, all that investment in, in, in arts buildings, it's often as a, um, a prompt to uh, um, uh, the regeneration of city centers. It's been about priming for private investment in, in downtown areas. Um, it's been about the stimulation of, of, of uh, the, the knowledge economy and the creative economy, the sort of, um, the, the sort of arguments that are uh, associated with Richard Florida. It's been about stimulating tourism. And it's not just been about single buildings, it's often been about complexes or, 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 or um, uh, clusters um, from West Kowloon to, uh, to Sadiat Island. And that trend is not, it may have started off in Europe and, and in the States, but obviously um, it's also a trend in China, um, the Middle East, and increasingly in, in Southeast Asia and in India and in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, uh, a lot of it is, uh, is uh, policy informed, if you like. Um, the most successful are usually where that investment is in the context of an overall strategy, which includes uh, transport, which includes all sorts of other aspects of urban policy. Uh, sometimes you have um, a somewhat naive belief that build and they will come, and you are left with cultural infrastructure, which is which is more challenging to, to activate. Uh, but the trajectory has broadly been consistent over those 30 years. Um, the last four or five years before COVID, there was an investment of about 10 to 15 billion US dollars per year in cultural buildings, either new or, um, or, or, or significant renovations. Um, along came COVID. Uh, COVID ground that process to a halt for all the very obvious reasons. Exactly how that halt worked out was a really a function of different public health policies in different countries. It was about the, the trajectory of COVID in those countries. And it was also about, to some extent, um, uh, the uh, public sector response in terms of emergency aid uh, packages, which varied enormously around the world. But we are now emerging and uh, from a period when, in effect, the, the, uh, the sector, uh, as I say, ground to a halt, international travel, local travel, 
um, uh, uh, compulsory closures, and of course, uh, equally on the on the on the uh, performance side or on the uh, real challenges in how you operate under, under circumstances of COVID. As we emerge, the critical question is, are we emerging into the same world or are we emerging into a different world? And are we still we? In other words, are the cultural institutions that are emerging changed by the experience and by other things that have gone on? Um, we know, or, or at least we know that the that, that trends in international tourism are going to be critically important, particularly for larger institutions in city centers. We know that um, uh, uh, the um, uh, behavioral patterns may, may be changing um, uh, as a result of the period of COVID. We know that people's sensibility about, about uh, international travel, as I say, you know, flight shaming, um, behavioral changes. We know that um, uh, there was during COVID a flight to digital engagement with culture, which is not therefore place-based. Uh, will that uh, remain? Will that grow? Uh, will um, uh, We know that um, uh, remote working has become increasingly significant. We know there are other changes happening downtown. Um, so the question that we're asking ourselves this evening, or well, the questions we're asking ourselves is, is um, how do cultural institutions, larger and smaller, respond to this? And what is the part that they will play in the urban debate going forward? I have three uh, outstanding colleagues to, to address these issues. Uh, Elaine Bedell, um, who is the chief executive of the South Bank Center, the South Bank Center, which is opposite, more or less exactly opposite the Houses of Parliament in Westminster, um, uh, and which grew out of the uh, um, the, the 1951 um, uh, uh, festival of uh, uh, festival of Britain is, I think, probably Europe's largest art centre, um, uh, and uh, is an anchor to a cultural district which stretches uh, from that west end along the east to to Tate um, uh, to Tate Modern. Uh, and uh, Elaine has experience of all the complexities of large scale cultural infrastructure. Uh, Gabriela Gomez Mont. Uh, Gabriella is, I think, currently in Edinburgh, uh, lives in Amsterdam, uh, uh, and has deep experience of, and wide experience. Her deep experience is in a, in a very innovative uh, position in the uh, uh, Mexico City government, uh, uh, in, in a think tank working on that interface between uh, the urban and the uh, uh, the urban and the cultural, and she is, I was going to say, a serial fellow at TED, MIT, Yale, and other places, but I think they overlap, so I don't think it's quite serial. And uh, our third participant is Andreas Gergen. Uh, Andreas is the head of the German Foreign Office Culture and Communications Department, and in that role um, uh, has extensive experience of both cultural diplomacy, but also domestic cultural policy too. And I think Andreas, who's obviously based usually in Berlin, is speaking to us from Abuja in Nigeria, uh, where he is currently, I think, in um, the, uh, the fray of the interesting issue around uh, uh, restitution. Um, uh, so, um, uh, and his experience draws not only on the, on the, on the um, uh, in public service, but also in Siemens, where I think uh, a senior position Siemens and began his career with the Berliner Ensemble. So um, crosses the uh, crosses the the whole trajectory. So let uh, one more um, uh, one more comment before we we begin in earnest. Uh, uh, we will be uh, opening this up to questions. So. Um, send your questions as you have them to the uh, to the um, Q and A section at the bottom of your uh, screen, and please say who you are and uh, if you have a, a, a position that you want to declare, um, an affiliation you want to declare, please put that there too. So, um, Elaine Southbank, you're at the very sharp end of all this. Um, uh, tell us, do you see as you as as you and the Southbank emerge? Do you see? Um, yourselves emerging into a permanently transformed um, uh, uh, position vis-a-vis -vis your uh, immediate and larger community? And um, uh, is your institution itself changed in ways that will um, uh, impact your uh, relationship to that community? Uh, good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me along. I mean, I think the short answer to all of that is it's too early to say. Um, we've been fully open since September. We are an 11 acre site with four venues, um, including the Hayward Gallery, but three uh, concert halls. Um, and we didn't have the whole site fully open till September. Um, 
We were closed for a large part of last year, but we managed to stream events from behind closed doors. Um, as you referred to earlier, we discovered um, just how much we needed digital at times like this. And um, frankly, it was a wake up call because we were not a very digitally savvy organization before the pandemic. And that will definitely continue beyond. Um, visitor return is pretty volatile. Um, we, we have the advantage at South Bank of doing a range of events. So we do contemporary music, we do classical music. Uh, we do dance, we do comedy, um, we do visual arts. Um, I would say that contemporary music is showing every sign of being alive and kicking and almost every gig that we've had has been sold out. Um, comedy, similar pattern. Um, a lot of the literature talks that we have been doing very well attended. Classical music, I would say, is still showing signs of caution. And so you would draw from that quite easily, I think, a suggestion that there's a demographic issue here. Um, older audiences tend to be the demographic, the overall demographic for classical, classical music, and that looks like it's a bit slow to return. I think that is not reluctance to come to the halls, which I think people understand are incredibly COVID safe. I mean, we went through so many precautions last year to make them COVID safe, much, much safer than supermarkets, for example, um, despite our lengthy closure. Um, but they are very nervous about travel. So we are definitely impacted um, by people's reluctance to use public transport, particularly the older demographic. Um, and in London, we have a very, in central London, we have a very specific issue around the congestion charge and increased parking um, restrictions which were brought in a couple of years ago and and have also put those constraints on people who might want to drive. Um, tourism obviously was a huge part of our ecosystem so the 11 acres incorporates bars and restaurants and a number of retail. Um, we were the previous year I think our visitor numbers were something in the region of four and a half million. We had 50,000 um, so we have had a massive impact um, um, in terms of overseas tourism and to some degree out of town tourism as well. So the things that I think are lasting are the digital um, um, platform is going, we are doing a number even though we're fully open and we desperately want people to come back and come and have the live experience. We're doing a number of hybrid events where we are simultaneously streaming and that isn't going to go away. Um, and we are post pandemic investing quite heavily in that digital in infrastructure. But there was a report out today saying that a number of regional theatres in the UK that had relied on digital broadcast of their performances last year are reverting only back to in person. And the thing we have to remember about digital is a purely economic one, which is at the moment you don't make vast amounts of money from it. Nothing compared to ticket sales, for example, which is a huge part of our our financial kind of makeup. Um, so it is it is one of those areas in which you have to invest hugely to get going and the um, you know the the likely results are um, as yet a bit hard to work out um, and certainly everything that we did last year was free um, and so um, the streaming was all all easy to access. May I just ask one question? Because you mentioned one aspect of the demographic, which is clearly there may be a reluctance with older audiences, not so much to be there, but to, but to get there, uh, and that has an impact. But but you, you didn't you didn't mention at all the phenomenon of remote working, and I'd be interested to know what you think the long term impact of not just remote working, but with it a sort of um, emphasis on the. Uh, 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 on the local and uh, uh, a tendency for people to sort of stay local um, uh, and uh, remote working for your own organization but particularly for all those workers who are around you and those audiences for whom um, for whom uh, a visit to the South Bank was a, you know a short post post workday you know across London commute. Yeah, well, we're very affected by it. Um, we keep saying that Thursday night is the new Friday night because 
many people are choosing to work from home now on Fridays, specifically Fridays. Um, so we're finding the site very lively on Thursday nights. Um, we're definitely affected by it. Um, again, we're sort of hammering out how, what sort of lasting effect this change in work pattern is going to have on us. So in terms of our audiences, there's no question that, you know, deciding to go to an event after work when you work in central London is an easy hop and a step. Um, if you've been working at home, it involves the commute in. It, it's it's altogether a much different schlep. Um, and so I think we're definitely, I know in particular, I think um, theatres are finding that they're very affected by that. And one of the things that West End has done has been to introduce the Sunday performance. Historically, of course, theatres never opened on Sundays here in the UK, but um, because of that shifting pattern, we're all having to think about slightly different ways of providing um, art and activity for, for people. We are closed currently on Mondays and Tuesdays, which is the result of the pandemic and the squeeze on our finances. We used to be open seven days a week, but that is partly to cater for that issue of, of people not London just not being as busy as it has been. In terms of our own staff, again, we're sort of still hammering it out. We're, we're currently two to three days in the office um, and the rest of the time sort of hybrid working from home, but we've never run a site that's open fully five days a week with that kind of working pattern. And of course we have some staff for whom there's no choice. They, their jobs require them to be on site because they're very directly involved in the delivery of the, of the cultural program. So um, again, I think it's, it's hard to draw any lasting conclusions from it, but there, I know that the West End theatres think that probably the Sunday performances are here to stay. Gabriella. May I ask uh, your perspective on, on the same issue, both with respect to the um, larger, often city centre located cultural institutions, and I, uh, drawing on Mexico City, Mexico City is one of the, one with, one of the cities in Central South America, probably all the Americas, with the richest legacy of particularly museums of, of national, international significance, which are in turn also uh, significant tourist attractions or have been historically, uh, but also um, uh, whether you see, or whether it's too early to see, a, a, um, a sort of tilting in public sector priorities from larger, what are often known as legacy institutions, to more community-based ones that are more uh, locally based and outside of city centres? Mm. Those are great, great questions, Adrian. Um, so basically, I think one of the, the provocations that I'd send um, your way in terms of many of the shifts that I've been seeing both with the cities that I'm working with in Europe as well as Latin America, is first of all, I, I believe that um, very much in the DNA is this question, perhaps not phrased like this, but that cultural institutions and cultural infrastructure, I think, is starting to think about how do you become infrastructure for imagination, if you will, that I think is, is actually an, a, an additional layer, if you will, to how we've been thinking about cultural institutions um, as of now. I think that there's a expansiveness and an experimentation that is happening in the civic realm, because you know many times a public, amazing public space, for example, can be strangers meeting in space. But there's also this way of thinking about civic space, which is no longer about strangers, but how do you actually build communities and networks that actually have these specific meeting spaces, but that also, so the, the, it's a thing in, in space, but it's also a thing in time, because many of these communities actually are um, working on much, much longer term projects. Um, so basically in Mexico City specifically, I'm seeing many museums such as Centro Cultural Digital um, that used to be led by Grace Quintanilla that unfortunately passed away uh, some months ago, but now by Mariana Delgado which besides becoming an, a fantastic place for ex exhibitions and all of these things that we've seen that museums have fi has functioned as, uh, since it has such a deep feminist agenda, it is becoming a meeting space for the feminist community of Mexico City in many ways. So sometimes this will take the place of, let's say, thinking about what electronic uh, publishing looks like. Sometimes it will be about um, get-togethers and expanding the role of um, 
of digital tools, but it has a social intention that allows for this infrastructure for social gatherings to happen, which I find incredibly interesting. So on one hand, in terms of uh, the larger public institutions, I do think that there is a, a multiplicity that is happening, uh, as well as a added experimentation. Um, I've also been very intrigued with, uh, OD, with OD in Helsinki, with the Central Library, that is now thinking of itself more less like as a library, yes, but they call themselves like a living room. So nowadays, it's not only about doing research and seeing and going to um, check out a book, but it also is meeting rooms and it also has, uh, you can actually host events there yourself. So it's becoming like the space of that you can take over as a citizen, which I find fantastic, as well as uh, the Central Library in Mexico City, the uh, Biblioteca Vasconcelos, uh, when Daniel Golden was the, the director, that you had a place where you could do musical recordings, where um, they were teaching sign language because there was a community, it turns out, around the library um, of, um, of people with certain disabilities that were using the library but didn't necessarily have access to these type of tools, et cetera, et cetera. On a smaller scale, what I find incredibly interesting is perhaps vis-a-vis um, -vis this multiplicity that I was speaking about, a specificity, how many communities and many smaller projects are actually functioning as new civic type, as spaces where new civic typologies are possible. So nowadays you're seeing everything from community kitchens that are also like tool sharing, or you're seeing uh, places such as Colectiva in Mexico City where same thing, like, you know, the feminist communities are gathering to teach skills. And I'm, I'm quite intrigued about how, um, the symbiotic nature of both the shifts and the changes in terms of the experimentation nature and this expansion of, of possibilities. And this, uh, as I mentioned, this shift towards um, uh, infrastructure for imagination, what the future could be like uh, in uh, uh, Amsterdam right now where I live. I've also been very intrigued how places such as the um, National Dance Theater of the Netherlands has a, a, a fantastic project, which is called Switch, where they're nowadays allowing for the dancers themselves to have budgets so that they can become choreographers. So it's a place of continuous experimentation. And then they have like the whole facilities of the theater at their disposal, everything from being able to create costumes as well as um, the, the stage designs and whatnot. So shifting roles and allowing for these places, especially during shutdown where there was no public events to actually become spaces of, of deep experimentation that then will go on to become um, public showings of what is happening behind the scenes as well and during the pandemic. So hopefully these will be some of the things that will happen beyond um, the pandemic. Those aspirations seem, uh, the the aspirations to be a community anchor in, in new and imaginative ways and to act and have a social function as a, 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 a social function and a function, a, a, a deeper function in community seems to me uh, to be something that has come to the fore for all institutions during, during COVID, large and small. I guess the question for many is, are there buildings suitable? Um, uh, do they have the skills to do it? And above all, do they have the business model? And um, uh, uh, Elaine, I know, I, I remember talking to, to your, I think your predecessor's predecessor, uh, Michael Lynch, um, who always had the ambition that, that um, the way he stated it, and I'm not sure whether it was his coinage, but uh, he used it very effectively, which was to be London's living room, which was to be an open space where people gathered. And the ideal was that they would come and then decide maybe to go to see something or maybe just to hang, but that it served an underlying social function, which uh, alongside its, 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 its function in performance and the visual arts. And yeah. Sorry, it was, it was, yes, it was an extraordinary innovative piece of architecture in 1951. So the, the Royal Festival Hall is actually, we call it an egg in a box. So the concert hall is suspended in a much larger square space. And the, the whole point of the square space around and underneath and above the concert hall was that it would be civic space and it would be available for people to use as they want. So it's it's also been called, it was called the People's Palace, I think. So, and there was always this absolute kind of guiding ideological principle that it would be open and available for anybody who wanted to go in. So we open our doors at 10 o'clock and anybody can come in and they come in to work, they come in to play, they come in to have a drink, they 
come in to think. Sometimes they come because they literally have nowhere else to go. And that's fine. We welcome all of them. And they are joined eventually by concert goers. And hopefully some of the cultural events and talks or the dancers rehearsing that we just have going on also in that civic space, kind of those things bump into each other and therefore people get a kind of introduction or an insight into some element of our artistic programme and that will gradually kind of draw them to, to, to our, our main ticketed programme. But if it doesn't, that's fine. Um, and we, alongside that, run very, very specific programmes, of course, for social inclusion and um, participation so we run you know um, monthly tea dances for those suffering from social isolation or dementia um, and you know anybody can come and turn up even if they don't have a partner and they do and everybody takes part and so we have that delicious thing of the the sort of unplanned and um, unprogrammed meeting um, our sort of orchestration of it um, so that we can seduce people into um, participation or just to observe if, that, if that's what we want to do. But it has always been a space that belongs to the community. That was the point of it that, you know, and many, many community groups use our space purely for rehearsing and book the spaces and we don't charge them. And, um, you know, because they're from the local area and we that is a very also a very important part of the ecosystem. Andrew, you're involved in an international dialogue about exactly these issues, which is what is appropriate cultural infrastructure? Uh, what are the roles that it needs to play in urban development? What it needs to play in cultural development, etc. As you look at um, Western Europe in general, Germany in particular, and even Berlin in particular, um, uh, do you see um, uh, what do you what do you see about the exportability or otherwise of the model that we have broadly lived with in, in Europe and the States over the last few decades? It's very challenging to say um, to say just in that right moment because I'm in Abuja in Nigeria, so I can't tell you how the situation is in Berlin. Uh, but just getting getting back to the initial question, I, I think or oh, my my two lessons from the pandemic is a learning about vulnerability um, in a time, in the same time, a personal vulnerability, which gives another sense to personal presence and the vulnerability of a society, which is basically a, a, a threat for the idea of an homogeneous space in a nation state and which leads us to a more enhanced thinking about communities. And, and uh, now going back to your point, um, so what we have seen in, in, in Western Europe and, and in Berlin is as all in, in all the countries, a sharp decrease in attendances in the museums, um, in the public sector, um, with a high amount of money spent just to maintain the infrastructures, um, which is good on the one hand. On the other hand, it's a anti-Schumpeter effect. So, so perhaps, perhaps we are on the way to continue to sustain organizations which do not longer fit to the effects of the pandemic, meaning to the effects of a reshaping and a redesigning of a public space or of a citizen space, and which do not correspond to the to the needs to the need on the level of a society to rethink about homogeneity. And homogeneity in our societies means to deal with the two key issues, diversity and sustainability. Um, and and on the in, in international level, so I, I think there is a catch, still a catch-up effect. Um, be it in, in, in Lagos with 50 million people, be the, the actual conversation about the Benin bronzes and the future of Benin City. There is a real catch-up effect, but but I'm quite confident that the design of the to build public spaces or cultural spaces in those countries who just start will light slightly differ from what has been built in Europe and slightly differ from what has been exported, for example, to the Arab countries 20 years ago. So it's very interesting. By by anti-Schumpeterian. Uh, I think what you're saying is that 
there is in uh, the evolution, at least of the private sector, a process of creative destruction in which um, uh, established institutions are pushed aside by capital markets, et cetera, and new ones spring up because um, either they are, there is some pro revolutionary process that they have adopted that pushes the other ones aside. There is a capital market and that capital market, um, uh, people looking for a rate of return um, or the highest possible rate of return, either rationalize as the euphemism is or close or move, move the parts around. There is no equivalent in, there is no direct equivalent of the capital market in what I take in, in the not-for-profit or the public cultural sector, which means that when the cards are played, they tend not to be replayed easily. Um, and therefore there may be great creativity and great fertility, but it's not necessarily taking place inside those larger cultural institutions that preempt the resources. Uh, the reason I'm sort of unpacking that and spelling it out is that that does seem to be one of the potential um, uh, implic one of the potential movements that one has seen during COVID, uh, which is to say that there has been extraordinary creativity, there has been uh, uh, innovation, both, both in terms of content and distribution, but the, the larger cultural institutions have inevitably been preoccupied with institutional survival and their priorities and their fiduciary responsibilities are about keeping their show on the road. And I'm wondering, uh, all three of you, whether you see a growing tension, if you like, between the fertility of, of creativity that may be taking place outside institutions and institutional preoccupation with, with organizational survival, or whether you see whether you see the relationship between creativity and, uh, and cultural institutions as being more harmonious. I don't yeah. see why they can't sit side by side. I mean, certainly in the case of South Bank Centre, which by the way is not wholly publicly funded. So public funding is only 37% of our, of our total funding. So we have always been necessarily entrepreneurial, flexible on our toes, thinking about opportunity. Um, but, but a recent example, I don't know if, if everybody is aware of a, a, an amazing artistic um, innovation in Peckham Car Park, um, which was the transformation of a, of a multi-story car park into a, an extraordinary art space. And um, out of that came uh, um, the multi-story orchestra and, and who, who introduced um, classical music to different kinds of audiences. And we have um, started working with them at South Bank Centre so that they can bring that style of introduction of classical music, for example, to families. Last Sunday, we had them here um, and they uh, did a series of introductions to instruments, players, music, um, for families and children. So, so I think here is a, a really innovative, um, if you like, disruptive um, kind of art, inspirational um, um, art um, organization that I think we can work very kind of hand in glove with because we have wonderful spaces too into which these these events can happen. But I, but I would not be so pessimistic about the survival of the bigger institutions. I think in the end, the very reason that South Bank Centre was born, which is that a traumatised post Second World War government recognised that what a traumatised nation needed was art and culture, not um, alongside it needed the provision of housing and jobs and all of those things, but it actually allocated a huge amount of money for art and culture because it is so essential to a nation's health. And in the end, it can be uniting and healing. And I think for those reasons, people will return to institutions and, and the wonderful things that go on inside those institutions. I, I would uh, tend I, to uh, agree with uh... Elaine, and one of the things I, I believe is happening in um, in Latin America in terms of large institutions, I, I completely agree they do have their place, is it, it seems we're caught in a catch-22. If you're publicly funded, a crisis comes, and then suddenly the huge budget cuts actually put so many museums simultaneously, simultaneously at a peril. And I think that we're watch, seeing that all over Latin America where, where museums that we're used to having, like, you know, strapped for budgets always, but still had things, budgets to do things, uh, suddenly are... Um, completely at odds with, with where the reinventions need to happen. And then if you're privately funded, then you're 
you're strapped into a more corporate agenda and you lose your freedom. So uh, perhaps one of the places of, of imagination and creativity that needs to happen is uh, precisely what you were pointing towards, Adrian. Like, are there other financial models um, in many ways to think of? Uh, one of the, especially if you start opening up the, the conversation to the other scales of things that are happening. So for example, in terms of urban agendas in general, one of the big conversations is about resiliency. And I think the pandemic has shown us um, that redundancies are necessary. We've thought about so much about this streamlining efficiencies and whatnot. And then suddenly when crisis hits, you actually figure out, you actually need your redundancies to make your systems work. And so for example, uh, the way that public space has become, it's has be, had this dual function, if you will, I think is interesting. So, you know, if we suddenly started thinking about cultural institutions and when a crisis hits, how those redundancies, everything from these places in New York that were used as COVID centers, et cetera, et cetera, do budgets come from elsewhere? Another thing is when cultural institutions come into specific places within the city and what happens in terms of the real estate value, why is there not much more thinking on broader terms in terms of the surplus capture of the of the uh, capital gains that are made by cultural institutions coming in and that are actually not captured by corporations and by private companies, but actually by the by the public, if you will. So I think that there's interesting things to think about there um, that hopefully will be able to break apart this um, again catch twenty two between being beholden to the private or to the public um, that many institutions right now, I think, is what keeps them in check, if you will, and, and unable to uh, reinvent them their, their way forward. I'm, I'm, not so, I'm not so convinced that the capital market equals with fairness or innovation. Um, so for the, for the public finance institutions, I, I, I think even if you maintain a structure, and a structure which has existed since 100 years has its own reasons to exist and, and may last longer than the pandemic effects. Um, but you have to put into it uh, a, a small incentive for innovation. And that's actually what, what's happening because I see many, many of the um, important public players opening up to another kind of community building, opening up to, 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 um, to more diversity, and to kind of um, to the to the digital space or to the virtual space to be shaped as a meeting space, even in in those big elephants. Um, what I was trying to say is, but there is still a need for more innovation um, because the effects of the pandemic will last, and and we are trained in that model you mentioned in the early beginning that we export products or we deliver services and people come to request those products and services. And these products and services will change because they are under, uh, to be seen under the criteria of sustainability. Um, so exporting big festivals will be, will, will be, will be challenged in the upcoming years. I'm thinking about the Berlinale Festival, even on the Cannes Festival. Um, and in the same way, what we are doing as governments or as cultural institutions, be it the British Council, be it the Goethe Institute, to try to export German, German culture by taking, by, by buying an, a, a ticket for an airplane and by sending a, a film abroad, that will tremendously change. Let me ask another related question, which is 30 years ago, somebody in charge of a cultural institution would be primarily thinking most of their time about what went on within it, the programming within it. You as cultural leaders are thinking just as much about what goes on outside it as what goes on in it. You're thinking about the relationship to a whole series of stakeholders in the local community, in the broader community. Um, you're thinking about the animation, not only of the building itself, but the animation of the areas around it. And you're thinking often about the, the animation of whole districts and your role as an anchor in those districts. Um, you needn't answer this personally, but how well equipped do you think we are as a cohort of cultural leaders for those responsibilities? In other words, uh, are we, um, uh, or uh, uh, are we, are we, um, um, we are, we're integral to the urban debate and the co contribution to it, but our professional formation or professional formation is, tends to be in the, um, uh, in the internal side of, of these organizations or has been historically. Do you think that um, there is a 
a need for and it may be generational change but a, a need for um leadership uh to to be more um skilled with more um familiar with their urban role and urban strategies um well i'm, I'm happy to pick that up i mean i i think the one thing that the last 20 months has taught leaders or certainly institutions is that they um, will sink if they're not entrepreneurial, flexible, thinking outside the box. I mean, we have all been so challenged by business plans that are frankly totally irrelevant um, and had to, most of us completely rethink the structure of our organization as well as every business plan we might have hatched in the past. So. I think you're absolutely right that leaders of arts organisations are going to continue to need to be constantly thinking about what the pivot is and what it needs to be and flexible. But I think many of them have demonstrated, certainly all of my colleagues, and we formed quite a tight cabal now in the UK. I think we've all demonstrated that we are more than capable of doing that. I mean, a lot of that, Adrian, in the UK has to do with the decline in public funding. So given that for most of us, whatever public funding we get is not sufficient to cover the costs of what we need to do, we have increasingly over the last few years had to find other ways of making, raising, um, producing further profit, um, not profit, but, but revenue. And so um, I think it's been the case for a while now that leaders have had to be quite commercially savvy and quite kind of... Um, yeah, innovative in the way that they're thinking about running the organization. You see a generational change, Gabriella. So I, I do think in, in Latin America in general, I am seeing a, a museums reaching out to other communities a lot more frequently of truly trying to build coalitions that go beyond the cultural and, and very much thinking about a creative ethos as a social resource um, that sometimes will have purely aesthetic outputs that I think is a fantastic thing to have. And then, you know, as uh, Luis Buñuel, the, the filmmaker once said, you know, a, a, we should not only think about culture uh, in terms of its, its um, what it produces economically and socially, but also even a language for society that we might not necessarily see its effects right away. So in that sense, I, I find that um, this need to reach out to not, not being able to maintain like a monolithic relationship to the rest of the city and the rest of your society can be incredibly interesting in many ways, because again, like you become more multiple, you're reaching out into other communities. This creative ethos can travel in very different ways. It can travel the scales of the city. Um, you can become a lot more hybrid in the way that you work in many ways. Um, at the same time, I do worry seeing this again, like I'm, I'm referencing right now, uh, Latin America specifically, that many times when um, there's a specific patron, if you will, for institutions, then you become beholden to a more commercial agenda. And in a certain sense, I think this expansiveness and this poetry and this freedom that comes from artistic practices are something to maintain. So how to walk that fine balance between both of those needs between, um, as Aline was saying, of being innovative, but also, you know, many times, being able to support practices such as experimental theater, for example, that might not necessarily have a, a huge revenue at the time is something worthy in terms of culture writ large. Um, but there is, I think, a, a new way of inserting oneself in the city and the society, which I find quite intriguing in, in general. I think it's worth pointing out in the UK, I mean, there's a very good point about the pressures of commercial funding. Um, I mean, let's face it, this government has provided £1.57 billion in the, in the form of a cultural recovery fund, and that was open and accessible to institutions as well as to the smallest arts organisation that was struggling to survive. So I think the recognition of the importance of, of those organisations, but also of the role that art and culture has to play, I think we have to acknowledge there, there was an absolute recognition of that. I'd like to open this up to questions. This is from August Tedesse um, from AA, which I assume is the Architectural Association, um, but I may be wrong. His question is, how did digital technologies impact and contribute to nation's recovery effort from the pandemic? What role did cultural infrastructure play in making cities more resilient, particularly of developing nations? And um, I open that up to the whole panel. <laughs> 
what was critical during last year, well, there was a rush to put a lot of stuff online from every cultural institution in the world. And I think the effect was quite overwhelming. It was also completely um, uncurated. And so it was quite high, hard to find the excellent in amongst the rest. Um, we decided that we would be quite careful. We, we were also acutely aware, we, were, we worked before the pandemic with, with over 100,000 artists and performers, and most of those were freelance. So we were acutely aware that there, there was a real issue for freelancers. So we did as much as we could to bring orchestras back because if they got to play, they got paid. Um, so that we could stream it. So we were we were curating our. Um, so we were very very traditionally putting the orchestra on the stage, putting cameras on it, and then streaming it or recording it and broadcasting it later. And we didn't have a platform to do that. We had never had a streaming platform um, on the South Bank Centre site. So we were sharing that with with existing digital channels um, or through ticketing um, organisations like Dice. Um, the result of the pandemic, frankly, is that we're developing our own channel. Um, and of course we are, most people are, because we have absolutely realized that we need that. But more importantly, we are now sort of in a, in a much more accelerated way, uh, digitizing all our archives so that we can put that onto our channel. Um, because we have also reached, we've also realized that we may need to reach those global audiences that were pre previously coming to us in different ways. So the digital infrastructure has been key and actually in South Bank Centre terms, we've invested quite a lot of money in it um, to continue on that digital journey. Uh, Gabriella uh, from Ramon uh, Marades, Director of Placemaking Europe and a student on the Executive MSc in Cities at, at, at LSE, our co-hosts. Um, a question uh, to you, how would you invest a billion dollars standard cost of a mega project, true, without the need uh, for building big stuff to improve cultural rights, production and access in a given place. In other words, uh, if there weren't that, that sort of underlying imperative to invest in physical infrastructure, what would constitute a, um, you know, a billion dollar strategy for a city? I would love to have a billion dollars, what can I say? <laughs> uh, well, I'll, I'll imagine my, my way into Mexico City once again, um, because I, I was working so closely with these types of subjects for six years. So I, one of the greatest potentials that I found, first of all, as you well said, Adrian, like Mexico City has, uh, it's one of the, the cities with most museums in the world. But at the same time, the physical infrastructure has never necessarily been followed by super juicy budgets. So I have the feeling that being able to equip the museums that we already have and that already exist across the city to be able to become expansive and experimental in terms of the way that they function both for Mexico City as a whole, but also in their specific communities, I think would be incredibly interesting. But since one of our questions was always how to travel the scales of the city, um, I was always very intrigued when we were working specific, very, very directly with com specific communities across Mexico City about the need for typologies that are much more idiosyncratic than these bigger museums can be, that very much serve specific ways of being of different communities. And one of the things that I did when I was chief creative officer for Mexico City, we crowdsourced the Mexico City constitution. And amongst many other things, we created an uh, urban imaginary survey where we asked 31,000 people across 1,400 neighborhoods, several things, including the future of Mexico City and whatnot. And to our surprise, uh, many of these the people actually responded that culture was one of the biggest attributes that they found Mexico City could afford them, like one of the things that they appreciated the most, sometimes even um, before education. But often we actually cut cultural budgets first. And working with uh, the participatory budgets of Mexico City, we also did a big survey of what was happening on the ground. And we found these absolutely fantastic spaces that again, were like hybrid beings between cultural institutions, but had a very specific social aspect to them, such as uh, Chavos Banda that were uh, um, a series of former gang members that created a cultural community that were giving infrastructure to bring in people out of gangs and to give them a, a way of making money within their communities or um, absolutely fantastic community centers that were a mix between senior citizen homes and daycare centers and just like a plethora of ideas 
So the other part of the budget would also be for thinking about the micro scale, like how do we expand upon the typologies of civic spaces that now exist? Because in a way, you know, libraries are fantastic, museums are fantastic, public spaces fantastic. But why have we not expanded upon the repertoire of the ways that a city can speak and uh, the, the, the type of social energies that can be gathered in these civic spaces? So that's what I do, a combination between the more centralized and the bigger institutions and giving them space to experiment and expand upon what they're doing, um, as well as the acupunctural, smaller, community-based, uh, idiosyncratic, uh, specific places that empower the local inhabitants to actually take over uh, these spaces, as we've seen with, as I mentioned, participatory budgets with quite astounding results. Andreas, Lisa in Berlin asks a not dissimilar question which is how can society or politics or political processes support cultural community projects compared to supporting traditional cultural institutions? In other words, I think, you know, the Humboldt Forum just opened uh, at a capital cost of, I think, 700 million um, uh, euro, which is about the billion that was a little, a little less than the billion that was mentioned for a me mega project earlier. Um, and it is, it is the case that larger institutions, for all sorts of reasons, preempt significant, but, but it may be merit, it may be political clout, it may be uh, all sorts of reasons, preempt significant sums, both of capital and revenue. Do you see, um, uh, do you see in this period of change uh, where uh, community engagement becomes, is, is of increasing importance and where there is an increasing um, emphasis on social issues of social and racial equity. Do you see a re a, a, a process of reallocation being needed, and do you see it happening? Well, the the Humboldt Forum was exactly the reason for my my silence. I thought I would not be in the right position to pick up on that one billion euro question Understood. because I'm not I'm not so convinced that this massive investment um, is really bringing things forward. Uh, now we have it, and we will work it out. Um, but but coming back to the to the question, you know, if I had to spend one billion euro, I would spend a third for artists at risk. What we see actually happening in Afghanistan should concern us, um, and I think there is a need for cultural infrastructure for those who have to go to exile, um, and that will bring will bring innovation also to our society. Second is um, a innovation fund. So I, I think money should be spent to foster, to enhance and to enable in the field of innovation. Um, and that leads to, to that question raised. This is, this is the way you can enhance community building in the, in the existing organizations. And it's partly done in Germany, or it's in a wonderful way done by the uh, cultural foundation run by Hortensia Völkers. Next question from, from the audience is um, from Serge Ramin. Uh, Hi, I'm a trustee of a local art center. My question has to do with the larger cities attract the bulk of investment in arts infrastructure, a similar point. And within these larger cities, the wealthier boroughs. 10 years from now, what is more likely, the Peckham or Newcastle branch of the National Gallery or the National Gallery in Hokkaido, Japan? Uh, Elaine, I'd love you to answer this because there's, a, there's, a, there's an interesting issue here with leveling up in the UK and the, uh, the, the priority afforded to London traditionally versus um, uh, uh, other parts of Britain, particularly um, uh, Northern England. So, so uh, and I think that one of, the, one of the issues underlying this question is um, in addressing one inequity, which is the inequity between London uh, funding and other parts of, uh, of England and those of the United Kingdom, will there be, uh, is there a risk of another inequity being exacerbated, which is an inequ inequity between the city center and and the outer and, and other boroughs. Yeah, I mean it's a it's a, a taxing question when when money is tight. Um, I mean I would argue that um, in terms of the government's labelling of leveling up, um, of course the places that they refer to uh, need that level of investment. You won't be surprised to hear me say because I run the largest art centre in Europe and it happens to be located in central London. But my view is that should not be 
to the detriment of a very vibrant, very culturally rich and diverse capital city, which also needs its investment retained in order to deliver what it delivers. Um, I think, of course, we and, and, and the mayor's office has helped with this. There have been the London boroughs of culture. So uh, there has been some um, incredible investment in the outlying boroughs of, of our capital city. Um, but it's tough. It's very tough. And the, there is, you know, in the end, uh, one of the, the, the big um, challenges that we have is the plethora of choice. And, um, you know, we have to reconcile that that consumers of art and culture have a huge amount of choice. Um, and although there is emphasis on the local, I think, in a city like London, where the centre still draws um, and and where the level of investment is higher, that is always going to be quite tricky to pull off. That's a very sort of uh, Britain oriented um, uh, question I aimed at Elaine, but more generally, are the uh, questions of... Uh, uh, questions of regional equity and geographical equity. Gabriella, do you see a um, uh, do you see a leveling in in your work? Do you see um, the pressures toward the preemptive pressures? I'm gonna I'm gonna combine that with another related question because um, uh, it, it, it's directly related from Pau um, Rosal Costa. Um, coordinator of uh, EconCult and strategic co-director co of Valencia World Design Capital Candidacy. And his question is, what's the relationship between culture and health and well-being? Uh, it's a space to explore after the pandemic for traditional cultural institutions, or is it one more hype? Um, uh, and I think that um, as uh, over the last 20 years, as we've seen different arguments be developed about the rationale for public investment in culture that we were talking about at the beginning. Um, uh, one where there's a great deal of um, uh, writing and some of it quite robust currently is on the impact of culture on health and well, uh, well-being. And uh, uh, the implications of that I, uh, may be highly distributive uh, in that um, uh, far from it being an argument for say, tourism where you need critical mass in a particular city center area, it's much more about amenity value to a wider community. And I'm wondering whether for all, uh, all three of you, whether you, see a, uh, whether you see the argument about the contribution of culture to health and well-being as being one that um, A, is likely to have increasing traction and B, whether that's got resource implications for how public, um, public and philanthropic funding is dispersed in the cultural sector? That's a great question. And perhaps uh, one of the things that I, I believe um, is important to keep in mind is that sometimes I believe we, we suddenly come across certain ideas of what culture is or what culture does that become monolithic in nature. It doesn't make them less true, but let's say the turn of her towards creative economies and asking culture to produce in the same way that any other human endeavor would, I think um, is incredibly interesting because yes, let's actually think about what design and film and the cultural industries actually add to our, our GDP and whatnot and all sorts of different types of value. But at the same time, what does it actually mean to keep exploring very different ways that cultural functions within our society. So I've been very intrigued in seeing, for example, everything from cultural community centers that are deal with loneliness from a very different perspective. Like you can actually uh, send the, both the budget as well as the, the externalities over to the health department of what loneliness is costing cities and societies. I think there's a, a recent book by Lorena Hertz um, that puts the budget for the UK into the billions of dollars in her book, uh, The Lonely Century. Uh, but what would happen if we started thinking about that capacity and that affordance of culture in terms of how it creates community cohesions, what everything from, as I was mentioning, community kitchens to these cultural centers on a more, much more acupuncture level, what they can actually do for a society. But I think that, you know, in, in a certain sense, we cannot necessarily decide that culture is and does a certain thing, but rather we need to keep the amplitude of all of these ways of uh, that both aesthetics as well as culture can actually um, add things to uh, layers to society, if you will. So, so I would be all for a continuous exploration 
of all of this, everything from, you know, the, the, there's been incredibly interesting results uh, dealing with PTSD with veterans, as you've probably heard, that are involved with um, putting on plays of Greek theater, which is, uh, you know, just like incredibly interesting from arts programs um, with people who have learning disabilities, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I do think that there's a lot more to explore. And, um, and again, that we should not necessarily cinch art to just like one way of being in the world because art for art's sake is also a beautiful thing. And so how do we just add to the growing repertoire of what culture and arts uh, does within societies? I completely echo that. I think it's, it's part of what us and culture do. Um, I mean, we, we do a lot of work at South Bank with, with dementia sufferers. And of course, music is the last thing to go with dementia. I mean, dementia dementia patients retain their their um cognitive recognition recognition of music way way after after others of other senses have gone so i would just like to echo also andreas's point about um artists in exile and to say that this saturday at the royal festival hall we have the chinike orchestra playing a commission by a young afghani female composer um who is only 17 um and so we are we are doing our best to support those artists who I agree are are much in peril. So um, I want to thank thank the audience for um, both uh, attentive, active listening and some fantastic questions. I want to thank the three panelists for uh, a really um, engaged and uh, I think important discussion. And um, I want to. Um, also just alert you to the, I think the final and the sixth um, debate or, or discussion in this series, which will be in early December and is on um, the future of shopping and patterns of consumption. And I'm sure some of the uh, same discussion around long-term behavioral trends will uh, feed into that too. So um, thank you um, uh, to everybody and uh, uh, please stay with us for the final debate in December.